This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you very much, Phil and Jan, both. Um, I've had nothing but the warmest welcome here at Emory, and I'm, I have to tell you how honored I am to have been invited here. Um, I said earlier tonight when um, Phil was introducing me to the board of the Aquinas Center and he quoted Time Magazine, uh, and I said, you know, it does sound really classy to be chosen as one of the hundred most influential people in the world until you really look closely at the rest of the list. It's Lady Gaga, three or four dictators, it is not the communion of saints. So <laughs> I come to you as a simple daughter of charity who's had a great privilege of working in healthcare for a long, long time and feels strongly about this nation's responsibility to everyone in it for quality healthcare. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. And, and I wanna tell you that I am open to any of your questions, comments, concerns, and, and it is an incredible honor to be invited as part of the Aquinas Center at Emory University. Tonight I come to you as someone who believes in Catholic health care and that it is a treasure for the United States. We have a stellar history in this nation from the beginnings with the Ursuline community in the first Catholic hospital in the United States opened in New Orleans to what goes on today in our Catholic hospitals. Currently, we have about 630 Catholic hospitals and over 1,600 Catholic continuing healthcare ministries like uh, senior centers, nursing homes, surgery centers, clinics, daycare centers, et cetera. It's over, that's over 2,200 Catholic healthcare ministries in this nation. We are the largest private not-for-profit healthcare group in the nation. We employ over 800,000 people, not to mention our large medical staffs. We are often the largest employer in the cities that we work in, and we're almost always among the top 10 largest employers. We have 19 million emergency visits every year, and over 100 million outpatient visits and growing. Our program focuses not, are not only on those areas that the community needs, but those the community needs that will not pay for themselves. And more often than in any other form of sponsored hospital, you will find in Catholic hospitals those programs that the communities need, but programs that will never pay for themselves. These include things like psychiatry, substance abuse treatment, hospice programs, neonatal intensive care, geri certain geriatric programs, and many others. In some states in this country, we are over 30% of the hospital admissions. And in the United States, one out of every six people admitted to a hospital is admitted to a Catholic hospital. We have a good track record for quality. And in fact, just a couple years ago, Thomson Reuters said that on average, one could find a better quality of care in a Catholic health facility than in any other type of sponsored facility, and that it was because Catholic health care and their boards considered quality part of their mission. Lastly, we have been an ethical witness for health care in many areas, ranging from the care of the poor, the dignity of each individual, and moral principles in medical decision making. However, it is really clear to anyone that healthcare has gone from its humble beginnings in homes converted into hospitals to really big business. The economics have become much more complex and in many ways have created competing and perverse incentives. Stocks that largely revolve around healthcare are some of the major drivers in our marketplace today. Modalities of treatment have also revolutionized, and that revolution shows no sign of, of slowing down. 
we've, all, we've truly only begun to see the massive changes that will happen in healthcare treatments. Even in my lifetime, I watched as a student nurse, patients with heart disease come into our emergency rooms and we had reasonably few modalities to treat them. EKG, maybe an echocardiogram, pain medication, oxygen, and a couple of cardiac drugs. Even if you couldn't afford your care, these modalities cost very little. And the major treatment for heart disease at that time was bed rest. Today, we have standards in our emergency rooms that require the ability to go from the door of that emergency room to the cath lab within 30 minutes, including doing all kinds of diagnostic tests before you get there and giving major clot-busting bust drugs and other modalities, as well as a plethora of cardiac medications. All extraordinarily expensive technology, but our cardiac death rate for men and women in their 40s and 50s has been dramatically and positively impacted by these advances. We could go through that in many other health conditions and tell the same story. Tremendous improvement in quality and outcome and significantly increased costs. Adding to this, the United States is in a unique healthcare environment in general and in Catholic healthcare in particular. From the general perspective, we are the only industrialized nation that does not give all its citizens a guarantee of health care. We spend the most incredible amounts per capita on health care, actually twice and more of what other industrialized nations spend per capita. In addition, when you look at the outcome and satisfaction statistics for those big expenses, we lag behind every other industrialized nation in outcome statistics, quality measures, and patient satisfaction, irrespective of who does the study, whether we do the study or someone from another country. Lastly, we have multiple forces today contending for the many dollars in healthcare that are out there. The pharmaceutical industry, the medical equipment and devices manu manufacturers, insurance companies, and a world of consultants and financial firms vie for the billions that are involved in U.S. healthcare today. This dramatically increases the complexity for making healthcare decisions in a rational way. For Catholic healthcare, the United States is also very unique in its response. I see this so often when I'm in Rome in the various Vatican offices trying to explain issues in Catholic healthcare. As an immigrant church, Catholic health care and Catholic education were developed in response to the needs of an emerging nation, and we've matured into important forces in that young nation. Historically, it is important to look at the fact that at a time when women held few management positions, and sisters did very little outside convent walls, and certainly not much at all in the business community, religious women developed in the United States the largest and most successful not-for-profit healthcare system the world has ever known. It remains a unique experience to this country. I know of no other country that has the kind of Catholic health care system we enjoy today. Also, it is very challenging in the Vatican and other countries to explain the importance of Catholic health care and, and how important it is to the almost 50 million uninsured in our country, to people from other industrialized nations who cannot comprehend the richest nation in the world not giving at least basic health care to all its citizens. Why, for the Vatican to understand why it is so critical to the care of the poor that we stay alive and vibrant 
is very hard to explain when they have no experience of any other industrialized country and many other far less industrialized countries not giving help, basic health care. Catholic health care has matured as the country matured and has been very effective in responding to the new health care environment. You will find, for the most part, that Catholic health care facilities enjoy strong bond ratings, high quality metrics, and have developed very efficient structures for everything from purchasing to systems approaches for quality and financing. Perhaps most impressive of all has been over the past 30 years, the intentional efforts of religious women to prepare the laity to assume the responsibility for major roles in Catholic healthcare. In 1968, as Vatican Council II was ending, there were in Catholic hospitals 770 CEOs who were religious and 26 CEOs who were lay people. Today, in 2013, there are four CEOs who are religious and 626 lay CEOs in Catholic hospitals. The sisters didn't just punch out. They spent an enormous amount of time and resources in educational programs, mentoring programs, and other developmental programs to prepare management staff, governance members, and now sponsors for Catholic health care. These programs help lay people to assume the roles that the Vatican Council called for from the laity. They help them to understand that while their roles in Catholic health care required all the same education and skills that any health care facility would require, Catholic health care required more. They were accepting the responsibility for a ministry of the church, and that is a significant responsibility to take on. In addition to these efforts, Catholic hospitals pioneered mission programs so that when there were not sisters in every department, there would be an intentional level at every, an intentional effort at every level in our hospitals to help staff appreciate that while this was a job where they earned their living, it was also part of the mission of Catholic healthcare and it gave it a special dignity and a special responsibility. Just as our hospitals had a department vested with the responsibility overall for looking at quality and overall for looking at finances, we now have developed a department that has a responsibility overall for looking and assuring the presence of mission in our hospitals. So what are the challenges that are especially concerning to the future of Catholic health care? I will go through some of them, not necessarily in their order of importance, but all have to be dealt with. The first is economic. There is no question there is a huge amount of money involved in, in every component of health care. And first and foremost, it requires absolute integrity with this so that the appropriate transparency is there and that the appropriate safeguards are there. We are handling the fiscal resources of a ministry of the church dedicated to the care of the sick and the promotion of health in a given community. That is a very serious responsibility. Financial practices need the safeguards that assure that the integrity expected of a church facility is easy to document. Another economic challenge will be maintaining the fiscal health of an organization. And this takes all the same skills and commitment that it does in other healthcare organizations, as well as the ability to balance legitimate competing claims. By that I mean we want stability in our healthcare organization for many reasons. First of all, for the good of the community, second, for the stability of employment, for those who've committed to the organization, and for other things such as our bond ratings, our ability to access capital and acquire new technology. But at the same time, we also want to do programs that community needs, 
but that will not pay for themselves. We want to be there to help people get the care they need, not just the care they can afford. We want to be an example of our church's preference for the poor. We want to be there for the undocumented who are not eligible for programs. And these and other claims compete against financial viability. It takes real creative compassion to do this well. Another challenge will be health reform. I think you are all aware that the Affordable Health Care Act has passed in Congress, unless you've been in a coma for the last three years. It has now survived a Supreme Court challenge and the re-election of the president and has been voted down in the House of Representatives 33 times since it was first passed. There is no question that this bill was as important and as significant as the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in the early 60s. And if you go back and study the history of the passage of the Medicare bill, you will find so much that is so similar, it will astound you. At the height of the controversy over it, I had someone research the articles in the New York Times for that period. It was a remarkable stroll down history's lane. The opposition to passing the Medicare bill was overwhelming. It was going to be the demise of everything that was good about health care in the United States. The AMA wholeheartedly opposed it, and in early 1965, after it was first implemented, we prepared for a nationwide strike of physicians because of the ferocity of their opposition. There were differences of opinion within the church, and clearly the same political parties were fighting over whether it was a much needed um, improvement or a socialist disaster. Today, not having Medicare is unthinkable. Let me be really clear that the Affordable Care Act is not the bill I would have passed. I doubt that it is the bill that any member of Congress or the White House staff would have passed. It is the bill we could get past. The many competing forces who have a strong financial stake in healthcare delivery system competed ardently, as well as consumer groups, unions, and the Chamber of Commerce. Having said that, I support the bill, and like the Medicare bill that we passed in the early 60s, this bill will be modified and improved as the nation learns from it. Catholic healthcare has long pushed for healthcare for everyone. Our church's official teaching is that healthcare is a universal right. We had developed at CHA a vision for what we wanted in health reform, and the first principle of that vision was the protection of life from the moment of conception until the moment of natural death. We made it very clear to the members of the House, the Senate, and the White House that there was no way CHA could support a bill if it contained federal coverage for abortion. As much as we wanted health reform, that would be the absolute deal breaker. I am happy to report to you that there have been two federal judges, one in Virginia and one in Ohio, who have now ruled definitively that there is no federal funding for abortion in the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> <coughs> But still, it remains a huge challenge for Catholic hospitals, as well as for other hospitals and the nation in general. How well we respond to this is going to be critical to the service we owe our brothers and sisters, to the fiscal health of our institutions and our communities, as well as how well we advance our church's call for health care for everyone. Hospitals took a very large financial hit in order to get health care for 30 to 32 million of the almost 50 million in our country who don't have health care today. That financial hole was to be filled 
by having such a large number of patients who were formerly either charity care or bad debt now become insured patients. If we do not help to get the exchanges set up and the Medicaid expansion in each state done, then we first of all will not have the care for our brothers and sisters who deserve health insurance. And secondly, we will not reduce the charity care and bad debt to our institutions and the cost shifting of it to businesses, insurance companies, and patients that continually goes on today. This is for you in Georgia, a real moment of decision. And I would encourage you to do all you can to encourage your state to take advantage of this for the uninsured. Georgia has the sixth largest number of uninsured people of any state in the union. And Atlanta also has the sixth largest number of uninsured people of major cities in the United States. You could dramatically change those statistics in 2004 by fully implementing the exchanges and the Medicaid expansion. Another important challenge for Catholic hospitals is the preparation for mission at all stages. When the sisters first started the education programs and the mentoring programs for lay people in management, governance, and sponsorship, there were many more sisters there to mentor and to talk about how decisions should be made coming from a gospel perspective. The sisters worked side by side in almost every department of the hospital to talk about the dignity of patients, how they should be treated, and why it was such an important calling for each of us as well as an important responsibility. With so many fewer sisters, we now rely on committed lay people to mentor lay people coming into our organizations at every level, having appropriate and compelling education programs, as well as mentoring and spiritual development programs that do this effectively is a significant challenge. This will not happen on automatic pilot. It has to be the fruit of an intensive effort that is always becoming more and more creative. The Catholic Health Association in the coming year will cooperate with CARA, which is the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, to look at the last 20 to 30 years of these programs that have been conducted in many areas of our country, but focused on the same thing, developing a mission sense and a mission heart in the people at all levels in our organizations. They will evaluate with the people who've participated what worked, what hasn't worked, what was most successful and least successful, and share that with the ministry as we begin the next era in education programs. Frankly, I see a big opportunity for Chandler and the Aquinas Center in, in this kind of effort. This is especially important as we have transitioned from sharing sponsorship with the, to sharing sponsorship with the laity. Previously, and we probably never paid an ounce of attention to this, religious communities, and in a small number of cases, the diocese, would be responsible to the Vatican for the ministry of, a, of the church, or ministry of the church. This meant that religious communities like the Sisters of Mercy, the Franciscans, the Daughters of Charity, would be responsible to the Vatican through the Congregation of Religious for a ministry of the church. It meant that if we wanted to sell some property, do a bond issue, obligate the ministry for a financial loan, we had to get their permission. If we wanted to sell it, we had to get their permission. It also meant that the hospital was committed to following the ethical and religious directives and functioning as a Catholic ministry. The religious community took the responsibility for assuring this to the Vatican. Because religious communities were aging and did not have as many sisters with the required expertise, and in response to the call of the Second Vatican Council, new forms of sponsorship were developed called public juridic persons. These are canon law structures that allow public juridic persons to be set up made of people who commit to the Vatican to be responsible for this ministry of the church. It is no longer the religious community that now reports. 
is the public juridic person, most often made up of a majority, if not 100% lay people. I can tell you that the personnel in the Vatican that have been responsible for vetting these new structures and getting them approved have been incredibly impressed by the transparency, the quality of the commitment and preparation, and the quality of reporting back and accountability that has taken place. For many lay people, this has been an opportunity to live their baptismal consecration in a much more important way in service to their church. Another critical challenge and opportunity are the technological and scientific advances we see on the horizon. Certainly technology in general has been such an incredible help. We look at the major surgeries that used to take weeks of hospitalization and now they're either done in one day or as an outpatient through these tiny incisions robotically. This is only going to continue. The replacement of body parts and the electronic assist for various organs will continue. If we add to that the emerging advances in genomic therapy and stem cells, we have a whole new world opening up. Genome mapping and stem cell therapies have enormous potential, and some of it is already being realized today. We see great work in some centers using genomic insights and matching cancer treatment. There are very important advances and very important ethical challenges to be studied and understood and dealt with as we harvest the value of these therapies. Stem cell therapy is doing extraordinarily well, and I'm happy to report that it appears much more possible and probable that adult stem therapy, stem cells from the umbilical cord and placental sources show much more promise than embryonic stem cell. Hopefully we will see in our day the abandonment of embryonic stem cell therapy. The Vatican, through the Pontifical Council for Culture, has done some extraordinary work in helping to showcase the advances in ethical stem cell therapies for a multitude of conditions. They will be sponsoring another stem cell conference in April of this year. For many conditions, stem cell therapy has the potential to revolutionize treatment modalities and outcome. Additionally, we'll also see continued research and refinement in drug therapy and the ability to take a new drug and determine in advance whether a person will be able to benefit from it or would have an untoward reaction. The last challenge I want to mention to you is the very important freedom to serve challenge. From the time of the Ursuline sisters in Louisiana who opened the first Catholic hospital to our day, this has been a constant concern and source of vigilance by Catholic hospitals. Indeed, when the United States was a young nation under Thomas Jefferson and completed the Louisiana Purchase, the French Ursuline sisters who had schools and, hospital, and a hospital in New Orleans were, had grave concerns about whether they would be allowed to continue to serve the people of New Orleans according to their faith traditions. There is a very famous letter of Thomas Jefferson handwritten to the Ursuline sisters that assures them that this young nation has great regard for their service and would never interfere with the commitments of their faith. This letter was on display for about two years, a couple years ago, is that exhibit on the history of religious women went around the United States. Let me be clear that the ethical positions of the Catholic Church have contributed enorm enormously to this nation, both for those who are cared for in our hospitals and those who are not. Our teachings on the importance of the care of the dying and what is morally appropriate has been for decades a treasure and a great comfort. Our stand against the destruction of the unborn at any time through abortion will always be a testimony to the church's commitment to the protection of the most vulnerable. <laughs> Our willingness to not be part of a culture of euthanasia 
that values people only for their serviceability and utility, and our constant teaching that these are important and critical moral positions that a, church, uh, that a nation must adhere to if it is going to be strong and endure has helped this country so much. Basically, the church's teaching on the dignity of persons and what that means in a social, economic, and healthcare context has been invaluable to our nation. However, there have at times been significant distortions of our church's teaching, and in my judgment, at times these have been as destructive and problematic as rejections of the church's teaching. For decades now, we have worked in a pluralistic society to maintain the protections provided by the Hyde, the Weldon, and the church amendments, which protect us from having to do abortions, from having federal funding of abortions, from being shut out of federal programs because we will not participate in abortions and sterilizations, and allowing us to continue to make invaluable contributions to this nation without compromising our consciences. When it comes to abortion, this has been an extremely important protection. As I told you, there is no federal abortion coverage in the Affordable Care Act. And not only that, there are other protections for life in the ACA. Some of these include the requirement to make medical decisions for patients on a consistent basis, not on the basis of is one person developmentally disabled but another isn't, and therefore we make decisions on how much technology will give one versus the other. Not only does the bill provide for significant health coverage for pregnant women, but for vulnerable pregnant women, there is significant funding for counseling, job training, addiction treatment, housing, among other things. This is really important, particularly if we want to prevent abortions. In our nation, we have seen an 8% reduction in abortions overall. However, in women who are poor, we have seen an 18% increase in the number. It does not take too much thinking to see why so often women who are poor feel like they have no choice. Having health care readily available for them and their unborn child, as well as these other supports, will do a great deal to help, help vulnerable women and their unborn children. Let me say a few words about our current challenge, and that is uh, the mandate to provide contraception, contraceptive and sterilization coverage for women. The, the mandate is part of uh, the, it, it's part of the preventive services that must now be available in every insurance package that is sold. It is an excellent comp concept to have a package of preventive services that have to be available to everyone without a copay or a deductible. The Institute of Medicine in this country tells us there are 18,000 preventable deaths a year because people don't have access to preventive care coverage. HHS asked the Institute of Medicine to define for women what were the key components of a preventive service package? What should be included in the preventive services package that would be without a deductible or a copay? For almost all of them, we would be rejoicing. They include things like mammograms, colonoscopies, etc. You know, for many of us, twenty dollars would never keep us from a twenty-dollar copay would never keep us from getting a mammogram or a colonoscopy. The prep might keep you from getting the colonoscopy, but the $20 won't keep you from it. But for women who are poor, a single mother with two kids, that is often meals for the last two days before payday or refilling her child's prescription. So getting those things in the preventive services package was really wonderful. However, they also included contraception and sterilization. And I will not go into the long debate and controversy over this and, and the road it has traveled and why we didn't get an initial exemption, but simply to tell you where we are right now. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about it, but it's the kind of journey that takes a long time to tell and is better with a bottle of wine. CHA said from the start that we had to not be required to provide this. 
And it's not so much because, frankly, many universities and hospitals in certain states in this country already have to provide it because of state law that they've challenged in court and lost. But the principle on a federal level was far more important for other things like abortion and euthanasia that we couldn't let, we could not let that stand. So where we are today is we are currently about to respond to a proposed rule that HHS has put out as their third iteration on this item. For this, religious employers will be defined using an IRS definition which distinguishes religious employers, um, distinguishes between, between religious ministries such as parishes and parish schools and hospitals and universities. Parish, parishes and parish schools are tax exempt and they do not have to file the IRS Form 990. For them, they will not have to buy contraceptive and sterilization coverage for their employees, and their employees won't be offered it. Um, for hospitals and universities, other religious ministries that are tax exempt but have to file a 990 under the IRS regulations, we, are <clears throat> we will be accommodated, and that's the difference, one group is exempt and one group is accommodated by virtue of the fact that we will not have to buy, negotiate for, refer for, or arrange for contraceptive and sterilization services. However, because the government wants these services available to women without a copay or deductible, the government will work with insurance companies and third party administrators, among others, to provide these at no cost to the women and at no cost or involvement by us. We will have no part in this. And if the insurance companies would fail in their responsibility to do it, we will have no liability for the fact that they weren't provided. As you probably know, there are groups in the church that are not satisfied, <clears throat> and there are groups that are satisfied. CHA is um, in its early review of this and we have said that it, there is substantial progress that has been made since the last um, pronouncement by HHS. And this major reason for that, we're not only very pleased that they've been very clear we don't have to buy, negotiate, refer for contraceptive, but one of the big issues for us and for the bishops was the very important and problematic part of the previous rule that was what they called how they defined a religious ministry. In the, in the definition of a religious ministry, they said that to be a religious ministry, you not only had to be not for profit, you had to have as your primary purpose evangelization, and you had to primarily employ your co-religionists and primarily serve your co-religionists. -religion, so that would have meant for our hospitals and universities our major purpose had to be evangelization. We had to employ Catholics primarily and primarily serve only Catholics. It's never been the history. Um, we, our hospitals and universities would have never fit that um, definition and we did not want to not be defined as a religious ministry. The CHA statement of our identity says we are a ministry of the church and following the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ we were not going to have that changed. I'm happy to tell you that it's all been removed and the only part of that four part test that remains is that we be not for profit. We will be formally responding to Health and Human Services before its April 8th deadline for comments and we'll continue to work with the leadership of the Bishops Conference, the administration and our members to dialogue this issue to resolution. This brings me to a final challenge, and that is some of the divisions within our church. We have great hope as we see on the horizon our new Holy Father and his focus on the church as servant and humble. Hopefully we can find a way to rejoice in our shared creed and our shared belief in the sacraments and have a more humble and discerning approach to other issues where we may not be in exactly the same place on how they should be handled, but give the Holy Spirit time to enlighten us all. Applause 
As we look at these challenges, it is important to remember that as we face them, the option to give up is not possible. The care of the sick is a gospel mandate. A church that does not care for the sick, promote health, and show special concern for the vulnerable would have a hard time claiming to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ. We deal with these challenges aware that while they are daunting, they pale in comparison to the ones our founders faced. A new country, a civil war, world wars, the depression to name a few. The faith dimension of our ministry has always been our greatest strength and that continues today. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.